Welcome to Watching Silent Films. My name is Yifong, and with me are co-hosts Lily and Bob. Hello. Hello. Hello, people. What's up? <laughs> greetings, <laughs> greetings. So what we do on this podcast is watch silent films or series of shorts and kind of talk about it. So that's our shtick. We're going to stick to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So <laughs> today we're going to talk about Buster Keaton's Steamboat B uh, Bill Jr., um, I think this was 19, uh, what is this? 28. 1928, yeah. 28. And, um, and we're going to talk about it as our feature review. And uh, before we get there, uh, I want to talk about a little bit what we've been watching. I've been thinking about this a lot, actually, is at, in the past pro podcast, I've been kind of stipulating that it has to be before Star Wars. And I'm like, the movies in the last 20, 30 years, even though they're after Star Wars, is getting kind of it, it can become a, a like a classic you know what i mean like for me personally i like fight club and that's i would consider that a classic and even in time it's become quite the cult and slash classic hit too so i'm kind of just gonna ditch that so you can kind of just say whatever you think is a classic that you've been watching recently baba lily anything my brother and i watched north by northwest that's a classic Ooh, that's for a sure yep. in every sense of that word <laughs> yeah, are you guys still tackling Hitchcock? Kind of going down the we are, list. We are, we are. Um, there, there are a couple left, I think. But uh, I'm having to search for them at this point. Might be on Canopy. I don't know if you checked. I haven't checked that. That's an interesting thought. Yeah, they might have the silence there. Convince your brother to watch the silent movie. Ah, <laughs> uh, I I actually thought about that when I saw this one. I I loved this movie, so yeah, Good. I said. Nice. I watched uh, when the Earth trembled. It came out in 1913. That was the movie I was talking about last ah. week. So I finally oh, yeah. got a chance to watch it. Um, it was, it was pretty good. Someone described it as like such a melodrama, and I have to agree, just because it was pretty dramatic. <laughs> and it's supposed to be like, oh, everyone dies, and the one of the, I guess he's like the lead. You know, his son dies in a boat crash, but he doesn't actually die. So he tries to take his children, even though he hates a wife, and he's just a jerk. And then he ends up falling. You know, he loves them in the end. I'm just like, oh my god, get over yourself. <laughs> mm. And then there's the big earthquake. I think they mentioned it for, like, the earthquake of San Francisco. That was, like, the early 1900s. So that was, like, a cause to why everyone fled their homes, which is why he also took in his grandchildren. But in the end, his his son comes back because he was alive, and he got, you know, he was kind of rescued. He was, like, one of four people that survived the crash. And his wife, that man's wife that the father hates, ends up becoming the children's, like nanny in a sense except she's all in a wig and dressed up and like it's obvious it's her but the, but the old man's like oh you seem like such a peach so then at the end of the movie everyone gets together and it you know they're already married so it doesn't end in a wedding but it's just like okay <laughs> i don't know it's like a 40 minute movie and i was like i feel like i didn't waste my time but not not quite a favorite of mine i don't know it was still kind of fun to watch <laughs> that's great silent film you could do uh, your own episode about it. <laughs> I, yeah, but I'd rather be passionate about a film if yeah, I yeah. do a solo. This one, I was like, yeah, it was all right. It was like it's a, a TV watch. episode, like one of a, you know, a, one in a series of 24 episodes. And I'm just like, eh, maybe the next one. <laughs> mm. I just did a, I just did a quick search, Bob. It, there are some Alfred Hitchcock movies, not a lot of the silent ones there's a handful I, I don't know the details but there's a few actually in there so it's worth checking out there's earlier, definitely earlier works maybe not the later ones if you're trying to tackle it chronologically i don't think it matters uh he i usually tailor the movies that I, we watch for his taste uh, i'm i don't know I, he I, he's in some ways more critical than me in, about movies and everyone always says i'm terrible like harsh on them um but he uh, he says he loves Hitchcock, so it should be easy. Yeah, he's definitely the master of uh, suspense, right? Yeah, so, he'll he'll um, he'll like anything by Hitchcock, I'm sure. <laughs> so, so anywho, uh, that's worth going for. Um, I watched recently. Uh, 
Your wife. Uh, Wong Warkai, which is a a Hong Kong uh, film director, um, who's very much known for In the Mood of Love and 2046, and most recently in 2013, The Grandmaster. Uh, but anyways, he um, he's done a lot of movies over the years. I'm kind of going through his filmography. Uh, the one I just watched is called Fallen Angels in 1994, five, six, something like that. It's it was pretty amazing. I had no, I had zero expectations. I'd never seen it before. So it's just a brilliant. Um, I don't even know how to describe it. Just a, a nice little. He's kind of like, um, oh, what's his name? Who's the guy that did uh, did that? Oh, Terrence Malick. Why did I blank on, it? blank on that? Terrence Malick is uh, uh, Days of Heaven. Uh, he's one of those guys who, when you watch his movies, it's not like a linear movie. Uh, and it's not like a David Lynch movie either, but his movies tend to be more like poetry and paintings, flashes of scenes, and they are typically just trying to convey some ideas. It's not like he's he cares about plot, beginning, middle, and end. Uh, he gives you these series of uh, scenery, colors, imagery, and they're incredibly and beautifully shot. And you kind of have to make up your own mind on what the movie's about. Does that make sense? Hmm. That's kind of hmm. the gist of Terrence Malick. And in the past, he only made like two or three movies in the span of two or three decades and like recently, abstract art on film uh not that abstract so it's not like <laughs> totally abstract art um like avant-garde it's still like brad pitt was in one of his movies hmm. um so it's it's sort of like uh artistic uh, uh credit anytime these artists work with him but anyway so he he's uh a hidden life that's more recent too so he's done a lot. He's done a lot over the years. Um, why did I bring him up? Is because um, the Tree of Life. Uh, what did he do? Yeah, so he did Badlands. He did Days of Heaven, The Thin Red Line, The New World, The Tree of Life, To the Wonder, Voyage of Time, on and on. So he's done a lot of stuff. And uh, I would say that... Um, the director, uh, Wong Kar Wai, is kind of like him, but except for uh, Hong Kong cinema. <laughs> so, hmm. anyways, I just find that a parallel interesting that they're two different artists from two different worlds, but they make they make kind of very similar things. Anyways, uh, cool flick if you like uh, Terrence Malick type stuff. If you even know who who that is. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's. Anything else? You guys good with this part? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to our feature uh, review of Steamboat Bill Jr., 1928, silent film, uh, comedy starring Buster Keaton. It's released by United Artists. This is after The General uh, in terms of the line of films he's done. Uh, this is actually, this will actually be his final movie out of his own personal studio. Um, what happened was after his short film career, as we, we've been talking about in the last few podcasts, uh, he started making his own features, started Three Ages. We talked about Our Hospitality last week. We talked about uh, Sherlock Jr. And uh, a long while ago, we talked about the, the general. And in between, there's two, four, five or six movies in between, between uh, Sherlock Jr. and Steamboat bill jr and so he made a uh, um, many many classic hits between his uh era this is between 1923 and 1928 one of his greatest outputs and i think this is the tail end of it this is at the tail end of the where the large mega corporate uh companies are starting to merge all these independent studios um buster keaton was working in when his in his short Silent Short Days, working um, under the Metro Film Corporation, which is kind of like their own studio, which is kind of connected eventually to, uh, you know, artists. But ultimately, everything is folding into each other. Into each other. Mm -hmm. And so his 
brother-in-law now, I guess, um, Joe Stank, who was producing it, he recommended uh, Buster Keaton to say, why don't you just go and work for MGM? Like, take the, take the contract. The days of, like, you personally running a studio is, is gone. Don't worry about it. They'll tr- treat you right. And I think, like, that guy's tr- uh, brother, uh, uh, Buster Keaton, will work with them at MGM. And they made another movie called The Cameraman where Buster Keaton still retains some control of kind of the artistic control of the movie. And that's probably the final movie. that So... Steam Bill, Steam Bill, Bill Jr. is the final movie under the Buster Keaton Productions uh, proper. Uh, then he went to MGM and he made The Cameraman. It was his first one. And he still had some control of it. And after that, they started to kind of take his control away. And he never really regained his foothold career-wise after that, which is a <clears> sad <throat> story. But that's so kind it of the... wasn't to do with his alcoholism. That's interesting. Oh, it's, it's, uh, no, it's, uh, it goes hand in hand, essentially. Mm. So it's it's uh it's all all of this is happening while his drinking is stuff is yeah happening too. His life's kind of spiraling out of control because of well Natalie. remember remember our hospitality was the final time that he kind of had a good sort of home life with right Natalie Talmadge and mm-hmm. after that from like probably late twenty three early twenty I don't know if, I don't I don't I haven't read uh, his bio so I don't know for sure but. Somewhere around that time uh, is when they basically, in terms of the marriage, is kind of over, and he's kind of like they're staying in separate rooms, and he's mm-hmm. kind of cheating and stuff, but not openly and whatever. They're just doing their own things, and uh, and that's where I think his alcoholism started already, while he's uh, making all these classics, and if anything, it would only get worse. And I don't think the divorce was finalized until many years later but anyways that's his personal life and it's kind of uh uh not directly in parallel with his professional career but mm-hmm. it, it, it certainly uh it would it it it, it would not be it, you know it's not happening in a vacuum obviously right so whatever's yeah. happening with personal life it'll bleed in into his professional life and i'm sure it'll right. affect it uh, yeah. in time so I mean, I'm dying to know who the instigator was because both of them just sound, (laughs) you know, it's like, oh, you have the famous one and then you have the famous girl out of the trio of girls, but not the most famous. I don't know. She just sounds awful just from learning about who Natalie Talmadge was. But then it's like, well, Buster's kind of a jerk, too, in one respect or another. But I I don't know. Like you said, you'd have to read the biography to see what it was really like. I'm just so curious. Their life's such a scandal. (laughs) Yeah, you probably Google some synopsis and brief summaries and stuff um but but i would say a lot of these uh stars have the same problems as stars of today <laughs> or they're just people you know people True. hollywood if they got problems, you. <laughs> it, it, yeah if you got problems you're gonna continue the problems you know, it's just mm-hmm. unfortunately the way things are so anyway so uh this is kind of the tail er, tail end of feature films where he had overall control over the quality of film and the story content and where things are going. And it's at some ways, it's kind of the height of his career, um, the pinnacle between uh, the last few, the general college and Steamboat Jr. But it's also astonishing to think that all of this happened within a span of five or six years. It's just, it's insane. Yeah. Like from 1923 uh, all the way through 1928. So a span of a five or six years, he made two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven massive classics. Not the other ones that weren't, uh, but there's this old theory, maybe not old, but there's a study, I guess, uh, somebody did on these creative artists, whether it's uh, like Renaissance painters or filmmakers or musicians, and they said that these great artists only have a decade, roughly a decade of great output, and then they're done. It's kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. So... If you look at the trajectory of Buster Keaton from 1920 all the way to 1930, that's roughly a decade where he contributed greatly to the like the not just silent film but film in general, and then he was done. <laughs> mm. I feel like that makes so a lot a- of sense because one way you know you just start out and then when you're in it you don't realize how much time's passed, but by, kind of by the end you're burned out. I I don't know. It's like doing the, this type of like you know film and theater on the side myself. I kind of get that. 
like how you can kind of be burned out by the industry. I I mean, but there's so many different factors, but to me, that makes a lot of sense. You have a good 10 years to like do good work. Yeah. I think they, uh, they even took, uh, the study to broader things of like even corporations, private corporations. And it, it kind of applies to where the, uh, a most amount of skills happens with it. It's kind of weird. It's kind of weird mm. when you think about it, but anyways, so let's get into it. Uh, what did you guys think overall of this seven reeler, roughly seventy one minutes runtime, uh, Steamboat Bill Jr.? I loved it. It was a big hit for you. Oh, it was a big hit. I I, I loved so many things in this movie. I, I my jaw hit the floor in many parts of it. Was there a specific specific things that stood out for you? Oh, there there are a few of them. I mean, you know, the storm. His uh, fighting the wind in the storm on the mud and using the slipperiness of the mud. And uh, when he, well, we didn't actually do a synopsis of the film yet, but uh, when he was going from the, from the, uh, the cockpit of the ship down the, down the three layers to go across to the other ship, or go across, you know, and then. Uh, to get his father, no, to get the girl, and then he, and then he, he went back on up to start the ship again, to use using the ropes to yeah, to crash into the house dirty. to save his father, <laughs> and then he he did it again to go to move the ship, like he was actually moving the ship ship alone to go and get her father, the the girl's father, um, the king, uh, Mister King. So I found that, but it, what what amazed me was the way he went up those layers, one after the other after the other. It showed uh, real the the physicality, what kind of shape he was in. Um, also, even the simple things like when he fell off the car and landed in a flip in the mud, <clears throat> it's amazing. Yeah, everything was well practiced, well run through, and I mean, you could just see that he's had incredible life experiences. Yeah, it's and almost like scene, everything he's done, it continues to prepare him for the next thing that he's yeah, doing. You know, and and the scene in the storm when the, when the buildings were collapsing. I mean, I thought about the the sets that uh, I said. Did he find a town somewhere that could just be demolished? Like oh, they built it. They built, <laughs> they it. built it. That's just that's crazy. Down. Yeah, I mean that's part of the, his engineer uh, skill, and the way his mind is wired, and also the people that work for him was at this point work for so long that they're they have a shorthand with one another. Yeah. So he would basically be saying, you know, like our last movie we talked about our hospitality. He built the fall set, the waterfall. He built the whole yeah. thing, right? And wow. It, it was just like, here's what I'm thinking, and it kind of like. The people that build says like, yeah, I got it, and they'll build something. It's like, oh, this is great, just tune it here and there, and it, because they're now about five, six years in or longer yeah. think, since the short. Days. I mean, in that scene when the building front fell off, and it had the floors. Yep. It, it showed that it was like a real building. Right. I was like, I was yeah. like, it did it for immediately real. went. Not CG, what right? is this like a real? Is this like footage from some real earthquake? I mean. What? Yeah. <laughs> Hollywood's wild. Yeah, they just they still do the same thing even now. They'll make dummy houses, but most of them are just completely bare besides the outside. So when they do have to destroy it, they just put a full set together. There you go. <laughs> Not as much, I'm sure, with yeah. the computers and stuff, but um but let me yeah, you're right. Let me get get people a, a quick plot summary. The plot summary is <clears throat> that um there is uh uh forgot the guy's name but there's a a, a character uh steamboat bill that's what it <laughs> that's steamboat bill yeah his he's the, that's the nickname but his actual name is william canfield senior of course we know canfield from the uh last movie our hospitality yeah, yeah basically the feud. yeah that's yeah exactly that 
it, it's a takeoff of that. Uh, but um, I thought anyways, I recognized that. I was like, yeah, that's exactly. interesting. He, he continued that trend. But um, but that was at this point. Remember, this is about four or five years later because that was only the third film. This is the final film, right? So it it, it it's a five year gap. But he he brought it back uh, for those that were his fans and remembered uh, this name. Um, but his it, it, uh, the character in there is Steamboat Bill, and he is a guy that's running a steamboat on some river. I I don't know if they specifically said which one, but. Mm-mm. They are uh, muddy, muddy, muddy waters. I, I don't know if that's the actual name of the yeah, river, or just river, a descriptive. But... No, they called it they called it muddy waters because I thought it was a musician, and um, is a it's a blues musician, yeah. Yeah, but I and I didn't know if they were related. I thought about that when I saw it, but I didn't know if that was the name of the river or just a descriptive of the scene, muddy, muddy waters. Uh, I think it was just a description. I mean, I didn't see any in research that it was actually a real location. That's why it's, I think it's supposed to evoke like the Missouri, Mississippi type, right. You know, rivers right. and the steamboat that goes up and down that area. I think right. That's the, the setting, right. The setting that we're supposed to imagine ourselves in. I just, I yeah. don't remember them. I kind explicitly. of imagined it as the Mississippi. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember. I don't imagine them explicitly calling it out somewhere. It's like putting in an actual time and in, in place. No, that, they didn't. No, they didn't. That I remember. But anyways, um, but so this, so on this river, Steamboat Bill and his uh, pals kind of running sort of the business on the river. And all of a sudden, uh, this uh, Mr. King uh, character has a newer, bigger, more fancy uh, steamboat. And, you know, basically it's going to, you know, it's a competing business, basically saying, why take this, you know, broken down Steamboat Bill's uh, boat? Stonewall Jackson. Fancy brand new ones, right? So, yeah. so right away you can see these uh, the inaugural sort of celebration of this new, the king sort of boat coming uh, down the river and is kind of scoffing at the, the Steamboat Bill guy. So that's the competition. We're kind of setting up the two playing fields here, two different families, you know, the King family and the, the Canfield family, and they're kind of at odds with one another. That's the start of the plot. And, of course, you know, the son of the Steamboat Bill is Buster Keaton's character, you know, Junior. (laughs) Who knows uh, nothing about any of this. Yeah, and so the dad was expecting him to be huge and, you know, a massive guy and turn out to be squeaky artistic peep, you know, and then he was kind of disappointed in him right from just the, uh, just the, you know, first. Apparently he hasn't seen him for. Embarrassment at first sight. Yeah, Yeah. something like that. Anyway, so. You kind of, and of course, this this is how I felt. You probably guys are different, but the moment that the daughter shows up was the moment I was like, "That's probably gonna be the daughter that falls in love with Buster Keaton," because that's how these plots work. Like this, mm-hmm. is, they're all they all have these melodramatic elements, referencing what you said, Lily. Like these mm-hmm. movies around these times, they don't really stray too far from some of the very basic tenets and plots. Mm-hmm. And again. Uh, even though it's l- very late in the silent film era, uh, Buster Keaton's still kind of using the same tropes because that's mm-hmm. really all he knows. Um, now the, mm. the actress, uh, Marion Byron, yes. I, I liked her a lot. She was very exuberant, very lively, and uh, had a real sparkle in her eye and everything. But what what amazes me is like when she jumps out of the, the bobber seat, they're sitting across from each other in the bobber shop. And... Uh, what what always amazes me is that someone like her, who's like larger than life, like really, really sparkly, <laughs> and she's so interested in this guy that, I mean, Buster Keaton comes off as like half zombie, like expressionless, <laughs> mostly. So it's kind of like uh, opposites track, maybe, you know, like he's like. Like what? I always I always find it funny. Like, what does a woman see in this character that Buster Keaton does? Because he's like so stiff. <laughs> he kind of, kind of plays like a loser character. I mean, he, he likes, <laughs> kind he kind does, of, yeah. He often he often will play the underdog, right? I mean, yep. it's like in the context of his movies, he'll often have this huge guys who are two or three heads taller than he is. 
and uh you know, like big joe for example and and and, uh, and others and then he'll just be the the shorter guy and the, yeah the but the way i read that weaker. is I, I read that is so clever and intentional that right. it's almost the surreal part of another surreal part of the movie that isn't i mean it's in your face it's obvious but it's not really called to it just is there it's a and very it's a, subtle tick it's a subtle characteristic on. of his movies. Yeah, exactly. And so that's kind of the plot, is that the, the, the two families, a little bit like Roman and Juliet, they're at odds with one another. <laughs> that's uh, so funny. Daughter. That's the first thing I thought when I, when I started watching. I said, oh, it's Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, well, they're all kind of like that, though. Like, even yeah. uh, our hospitality, you know, that's why I said uh, in the little. beginning. That's why I said in the beginning, it's like, the, the, the female character, of course she's going to fall in love with, like... Yeah. There's no reason to introduce an extra ne- like extraneous one. There's just mm. there's almost no reason that they are existing except to service the plot of the film is that they're going to be the love interest and then they'll get married and stuff like that. You know, yep. it's, it's kind of like the the way the cookie crumbles with all these type of plots. So that's kind of the plot is that and then he uh you know his dad tries to get him to to kind of help with the boat and stuff like that and then they have competing interests and kind of the and then finally, at the very end, is kind of like a hurricane or a cyclone or something that tears down the entire town. And basically, uh, Buster King triumphs at the end and rescues everyone, basically. Kind of, it's uh-huh. kind of the high-level plot summary. Um, there's a lot of details in between, but that's kind of the high-level plot. An, now, there was another thing that really struck me funny. It's like, when I first started watching the movie Steamboat Bill Jr., the first thing I thought about was Steamboat Willie by Disney. And I and I so I looked up the dates and Steamboat Bill 1928 was released in May and Steamboat Willie was released in January of 29 and is also listed as being made in 1928. And I thought, okay, well, obviously Disney was inspired by Steamboat Bill. Well, because yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, if I remember Steamboat Willie correctly, he he goes down and shows like all the mechanical guts of the of the boat. Yes. And I thought it seemed to me that Disney was inspired by Steamboat Bill. I mean, the fact that they were only, you know, six months apart and he basically started making Steamboat Willie right after Steamboat Bill came out. So he was following a trend, at least. Hmm. Uh, Kind of. I mean, it, it definitely was an homage to it specifically. But I will say that there, both movies are actually inspired by the song Steamboat Bill. It's a composition by uh, baritone Arthur Collins in 1910s. Ah, How do you know that? that? <laughs> it, it's also a popular... that. That thing, that that theme song of the da 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 da, and then the whistle with the steamboat. Well, it was the, 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 in, in that, Steamboat Bill, they were using the Air Force song. Well, off we the, go into the wild blue. Well, are you talking about the the film score that you watched? Uh, for ah, the movie? was was the one I watched on Canopy, not the original score. Well, there are multiple. Like a lot of silent films, there's usually multiple tracks for it, right? Uh, the one so I we heard... don't really know what's the best track. You uh, might watch one version. The one like, I heard was... was Off We Go Into the Wild Blue Yonder. Yeah, and that's because it's like public domain and you know, uh-huh. nobody wants to compose for it. Uh, now, I'm not saying that the uh, film composers wouldn't use the actual Steamboat Bill theme with this movie. I'm just saying a lot of these silent films don't always link like that so you do you do not believe that was the original score um i i don't know i don't i don't see the evidence that there was a score written for this specific movie and let me see if there's somebody actually wrote. Yeah, right yeah i don't think they wrote a score for buster keaton's uh steamboat boat jr so it's kind of like whoever's packaging the movie in your case is like canopy and whatever rights that they they've got is that right it, it's that one and and on the Blu-ray, it's usually different. So I've probably heard a different uh, score. And on the film, on the on the DVD or Blu-ray, I actually saw two separate tracks for it. There's a different composer using different music for it, in addition to the one that is already on the on the disc. Sometimes you'll have like two to maybe five to ten different scores 
hmm. for a single movie. Like back in uh, Battleship Potemkin, Potemkin, it was the same thing. All these silent films, because they're silent, right? Mm-hmm. It's Sometimes it is uh, there are uh, original compositions, like Nosferatu had one, but more often than not, they don't always have one. They have just general directions, and then the film accompanist who's playing at the theater will improvise and make their own, ah. which happens to this day still. So, like, if somebody is playing for this movie live, if they're showing this live in the local theater, somebody will, if they hired a, a accompanist that will come in and improvise you know, on the fly. Gotcha. But um, the the way that the movie was made um, was because um, the uh, actually Chaplin's frequent collaborator, his name is Charles Risner or Reisner, uh, who was also directing this movie. Uh, he sort of had this original idea of sort of this, you know, steamboat thing, but also primarily based on these songs uh, and this song evokes an era of like being on the st- steamboat in that setting, you know, in the older times, you know, the yonder times of the, the older South type of thing. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So anyway, so the author Collins is a popularize it, but actually he didn't even originate it. This whole thing actually uh, was a, a term called the, well, the title of it's called the Turkey and the straw. It's a composition popularized within the minstrels. Too. Minstrel Z, I don't know what that means, during the 19th century. So if you Google around for that um, that term on YouTube or Arthur Collins' original composition to popularize it, that's the same theme that Mickey Mouse was whistling at, at the start of his... Turkey in the hay, Turkey in the straw. Yeah, so mm. that's, ah. that's the whole composition that he, they're kind of playing off of. Uh, in his because theme of Willie, of course, is sound, right? Uh, but right, but uh, the Buster Keaton one didn't have sound, as they, they couldn't probably do that. But the actual story was inspired by the the takes uh, on the whole feeling and concept of that. Does that make sense? So y- yes, the title was inspired by the Buster Keaton movie, but actual the but the actual content for both works, the Buster and the Disney one was inspired by the actual uh, song and the feelings of the what the songs evoke about being on the river with the in the steamboat. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they just happen to cross-pollinate at the same time, which is, by the way, a phenomenon in film, just in general, where two competing ideas will, even though they will do it unbeknownst to each other, come out at the same time. <laughs> mm. Do you know about this phenomenon, Bob? Or Lily? Oh, of course. All the time. Like uh, Armageddon, mm-hmm. Deep Impact, you know. Absolutely. Same year, oh, yeah. Same type of movie. Or uh, we talked about this before. The What's it called? The um, the Prestige and... Uh, the Illusionist. The Illusionist is <laughs> another yep. example. There are many of those types. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, many. Many yeah, examples. Yeah, on and on. So, um, so that's kind of the, how it all came about. But the... Um, the so you like this um in terms of the the story element or just the different gags he was uh uh the story was okay i mean you know i mean i mean no it's it's the story isn't um complex at all i mean there's nothing complex to the story it it, it seems more like a vehicle for all the stuff that Keaton likes to do, and that that is phenomenal physically. I'd I mean, have to agree. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's not, not that complex. it was a bad movie. It, no, but it's not complex. Yeah, it's just yeah. kind of after watching all these features now, they kind of all. I mean, they're all similar in a sense. They have their yes. different quirks, but it's I don't know. Give me something else, something new, something exciting. We kind of right. always get the same tropes. But I know that's to, that's because it's, you know, that's Keaton's shtick. But at the same time, you want just something a little different. It's like when we were talking about the Frozen North. He was a, uh, why did I say that word? North. <laughs> the Frozen North, where he's the bad guy. And it's like his most violent film, quote unquote violent. But it was cool because he played someone different. Mm. 
Yeah, I was trying out new ideas, I think is what your point is, right? Versus yeah. just going through back the same sort of similar types of things. And like you guys say, the, these films are, of course, like any silent film comedy, they're always vehicles to make sure you see what these silent film comedians are best at. That's the that's kind of the whole point when they created these plots, right? Uh, a very common thing, and this is how they develop the script. They're off, they don't always write it, uh, write the whole story out from scratch, from start to finish. They'll have an idea of what they want to do. Hmm. They'll start the movie, get on set, and Buster Keaton, for example, in this situation, will get on set, work with his team of 10 to 5 to 10 gag people, gagmen, and they'll figure out the gags. And as the gags are created, so does the rest of the plot come string along. And that's why you see that these films often are showcases for these gags because that's how they develop in movies. They don't. They typically don't have a finished script on the, the Kevin Brownlow book or, or many other interviews with these silent film stars, the comedian stars. They'll often say, oh, do you have a finished? And they're like, no, nobody ever plan. Uh, generally, uh, there are some, but generally it's not like totally planned out from start to finish. And it's like completely improvised. They'll just like, hey, let's start the movie. All right. What do you want to do next? <laughs> 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 is that crazy? You know, like, mm. no, no, I mean, they have some ideas. Obviously, they have to build sets. They have to spend money. Uh, but they, I think they have outlines is probably what they have, but they, they don't have like details of here's the dialogue. Here's this. Uh, all of that is the details are worked out on set and, and or post productions until they complete the whole film, which is kind of shocking. If you think about it, what happens afterwards, you know? So Lily, what you, what your, what was your take on the whole thing? Um, I, I, Kind of like what I was agreeing with Bob, you know, it's just kind of another, another Buster Keaton film, but I liked it. Um, the father Steamboat Bill, he reminded me a lot of my boss that I work with in Salem for the Halloween season. Like he looked like him, his expressions reminded me of him. So I instantly related to that character because, uh, he's kind of really goofy, but you know, he, he, I don't know. He has that sass. He's, he's not. He's not happy about his son, but he's dealing with it. It's just the way he reacts. It was pretty funny. Um, you know, I just like that, you know, he's embarrassed because, you know, his when his before he finally meets his son, is he's the queer artsy type. That's what I wrote. <laughs> Cause you know, he's got the beret, he's got his fancy attire, but he's not the ideal pick. Um right. Yeah, he's not the the husky guy that he thought he would it would be like himself. Yeah. Or, you know, being dirty and working engineer and just yeah he's got yep. a ukulele <laughs> yeah i know that was very funny Which he steps on his dad steps on it's yeah funny. i felt bad and he Odd buster was so sad too and i was like oh your uke <laughs> well because of you know his reputation he's got mm -hmm. something to keep up right his dad yeah Which it's funny he when makes, he has a whole makeover right yeah <laughs> yeah well his... that's two things were funny in that the first was when i saw him carrying the ukulele i thought I didn't know where the film was going, so I thought, well, gee, the, the, they were talking about being out of money and the ship being run down and then being condemned. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be neat when, he, when I saw his son with the ukulele, I thought maybe he's going to be an entertainer and raise money and people are going to come visit the boat mm. with, to, and give money for his playing. That wasn't to be. <laughs> and when they were shopping for a hat and they were going to have one hat after that I was I was very amused but I, I said to myself I swear it's going to end with the hat he usually wears and yep. it didn't it was like oh well, that's cool he, he did have it on for a second and he was like well, no 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 not that one Remember? <laughs> yeah that was pretty good I was surprised he didn't keep it I was like, I, okay. I, the camera I was like not, not this movie not he this did movie. that to tease the audience it guarantees exactly. so funny that's the funny bit well he had a chaplain on one on as well and maybe even right. like the the he's, others, the, yeah, the other silent yeah. film comedians, like Harold Lloyd. He's making fun of the other ones, you know. Uh, that makes think sense. About, yeah, that's great. Wears, that's great. Harold Lloyd wears like I don't know. They remind me. I uh, like. I feel like if you're gonna go on a yacht, it's like the hat Harold Lloyd wears or something. I don't know. I can see. Yeah, that. I don't know the name of it, but he's he definitely pokes fun at all the different hats. Of all the if you it's it's so interesting we can identify the comedian by their hats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would be great to do. I think I might do this. I might actually do a picture of each of the hats in a line, and just to see who they go to. Yeah, just to show, just to have. A, it would be funny. I could I could do like the hats, mm 
and then down below have all the stars without the hats and have people have to draw lines to match the hats to the people and only people who know silent films would know it i mean people who doesn't know who don't know keaton and chaplin and mm. you're not gonna know it well what's funny too with that scene is i remember telling my my dad before it's just like i wish we still kind of wore hats because you know everyone always <laughs> used to like look so much better i feel like women don't wear hats anymore uh, my mom would tell me, you know, when they went to church on Sundays, you know, everyone dressed up and, you know, guys took off the hats. Ladies could still wear their, you know, their fascinators or whatever. <laughs> but it's like, I don't know, the, just that trend has ended throughout the years and now no one dresses as classy. So I liked seeing all the different types of hats and just it just because it was of that time and era. But for me, it's I don't know, just like thinking it's nostalgic even though it's not yeah it's like a it's another one of those uh almost documentary moments of capturing a a specific uh place in time that is long gone i mean there are still you know men's warehouse or some sort of like uh male fashion places that still exist but the styles like that is probably no longer existent yeah Mm -hmm. that type of style you kind of have to dig through the thrift stores or or something uh you know dedicated unique stores that might have that but in general like modern styles don't look like that generally you know yeah and they don't have real tailors anymore either but like you said yeah. unless it's at a men's warehouse or whatever they're called like a tuxedo shop right mm-hmm. but that's it yep yep I don't... it makes me want to now wear a hat <laughs> yeah, I want to wear yeah. hats. Are you kidding me? I love it. You can do uh, Indiana Jones fedoras. Always. Oh yeah, yeah. But yeah, so the uh, the uh, what's it called the barber scene was pretty funny too, where the barber didn't really have to do much. <laughs> you know, just zip, zip. Yeah, take yep. that barnacle off his lip. <laughs> <laughs> I know. In the dial, of course, like a lot of Buster Keaton movies, the written. Uh, I didn't write any of them down, but as I was reading them, the intertitles, if they appear, are hilarious. Yeah, right? a lot yes. of them are really funny in this one. There's, I wrote a couple down myself. Oh, my God. <laughs> you want to read them? Because I didn't write any down. Well, yeah, like at the beginning, before we meet Buster's character, uh, his father's looking for him, and he sees his group, well, he's looking at, he thinks it's Buster, and then it's another guy, then he runs to this group of guys, and they're all where so the... The thing for his father to find him is like, oh, I'll be wearing a white carnation. You can't mm. miss me. So I guess it's like Mother's Day weekend or something. <laughs> All the men are wearing carnations. And I know, everyone's this. wearing one. Of course. And Yeah, detail, so he, ha- right? he has this group of three guys. He's like, any boys look- Any of you boys looking for a father? <laughs> they're all just like, no. <laughs> they're all like in their probably 40s. <laughs> they're like, they no. look at him like, what? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> And then, it's very clever. That's very clever. You know, it, it, it's clever that, you know, obviously he's saying it in a good way, but it sounds like they're, he's offering. Mm. Like he's offering them. Any of you guys want a father? Yeah, he's like adoption, <laughs> right? Adopting the, the people. Yeah, but no matter what context you get that, it's still kind of a weird and funny no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no. That's the funny <laughs> no, part. No. Yeah. <laughs> but the just later... Oh, yeah, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 no. I'm going to change the scene. I mean. Oh, I'm changing the scene to the jail scene with the second intertitle card. Oh, I love that red. one. <laughs> I love that one. I love that one. I was That was so funny. When he was sitting down and took the tune and started to do sign language to his father trying to tell him there was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's so he was like, he's like, what is this? Ah, get away from me. He was like, yeah. there's a bar. There's no bar. By moving his thumb, he was like, see, bar, no bar, bar, no bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah because oh. the thing is he's for the audience he is trying to i mean it's kind of obvious he brings in this giant loaf of bread and you're like oh gee is he actually trying to feed his father no he's got hidden tools in there right it's like it's a dummy bread <laughs> oh, it's so funny so- I, was, I was really laughing <laughs> But the other thing I laughed at really hard that made me laugh out loud was uh, when he knocked the life preserver into the water and it sank. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> I was oh like, my God. What? No wonder the boat got <laughs> condemned. <laughs> I 
I know, and then he looks and he's just like, Ugh. <laughs> the back to the bread scene. I, I, didn't he fall into this massive pothole or puddle? And yes. Was like, yeah. Did, did he whole sail get in? And if so, wouldn't the bread be soggy at that point? You know. No, he only go in up to his uh, up to his upper thighs, oh, and I that's forgot. because the puddle was really only about a foot to, uh, a foot. About about a foot and a half deep, I think. Okay, and I what he did he is he bent his he went down on his knees, so he looked like he was up to his <laughs> up up halfway up his thighs. That's you know, well, I, I, I looked at that a... very carefully because I was like, how deep was that? You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm just but yeah, especially here. after all the tools fell out, and he was just like he was saying, that "What was did so... he say?" He said, oh, it happened to fall into the tools, the bread. Yeah, I know. Yeah. When you know, the bread happened to fall into the tool chest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. But, you know, it made me think of Lucille Ball and the I Love Lucy show when that happened. I was like, wow. you know, that's Which, of course, you know, probably. Played off of him a lot. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you think about all the letter stuff. I believe Buster Keaton about... was on the Lucy show one time. Well, I don't know. Maybe I think was he happening. was. I think he was a guest. I made a guest appearance with her. Okay. When did that show air? Was that the sixties? Uh, I know it's that older. would be late sixties, early seventies. Late sixties, probably. Mm. No, it might have been earlier than that. The I Love Lucy show might have been earlier than that. It might have been so, uh, I mean, mid fifties. Lucy yeah. turned. It eventually became colorized, right? I know. Yeah, that there much. were like four incarnations of the, of Lucy shows. Hmm. There was the I Love Lucy show. There was the Lucy show. There was. Um, there was another one where she had a different name but similar character. And it was, uh, Lucille Ball show. Yeah, they they had, he had she had different iterations of it because she uh, I think got divorced from the Desi because Arnaz. her husband on screen it was her real life husband. Yeah, Desi Arnaz. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot his name. And yep, Ricky Ricardo. Got divorced, I think. And then that's how she continue to have these career uh, TV shows that didn't have him in it. So that might right. be the era that where, where he was on. But anyway, but that's a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was on there. I just looked it up on the Lucia Ball show. Anyway, um, so that's kind of the uh, probably the first half of the movie where it's, I, I think one of the key elements I took away from this is that in the five years, sort of the the end, this should be kind of his, if he was taking, if he was studying for the PhD, kind of the defense of, you know, his paper or his book that he's writing. So he's getting his PhD, not that he was studying for it. But like, you know, if he had to defend this, this is one of those works where it's like, it's the summation of all his skills, if summation of all his work of all the efforts and blood and sweat that he has uh, done in films up to this point. And I think one of the things that, although we don't always, you know, like we talked about early, kind of like the plot details that he goes for, it is kind of uh, interesting that he he's very skilled at this point in creating films and not just gags. Because in the shorts, in the older shorts, it definitely was very much gag-based and less so the story based, but just like uh, our hospitality and all of the movies that he's made since that time, um, including like the general, these gags are still in service of the plot and, and the story. So he's still sort of servicing the plot of the film itself. while of course showcasing his gag, you know what I mean? And that his direction continues to evolve and continues to grow, you know, as a, a film director to tell a story is the point. So all of the story is uh, cushioned by all these gags, you know. So that's kind of the 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 character moments that shows up, you know, where like the first half, and then once after the ship was condemned, he gets, you know, or oh, we already talked about that bit, but at the end of the day, you know, he gets into this hospital, and that's where the final scene takes place, where the cyclone starts to hit, which is which leads to the final big hurrah. The big finales. What do you guys think of the last? I thought it was amazing. When the cyclone, whatever you call it, hits. Yeah, I thought it was amazing. Pretty crazy, yeah. I mean, you had it. I wasn't expecting, 
you know, even though everything is getting blown away, just having the trees in the background even be swaying like it's about to have a bad storm. I was impressed because I was wondering how big those fans had to be and how numerous. Amazing. Yeah. I when he when yeah. When he's leaning into the wind and on that mud, it's just I was I was really floored. I was like, look at that, you know. It's pretty funny. <laughs> and well, then, it's basically and then, jet engines. And point. then when he went from a split to straight standing up using the mud to slide his feet, I was like, Wow, the the strength that that takes, I mean this yeah. Talk about getting a groin pull, that's you know, yeah. wow. <laughs> I didn't even know he did that. <laughs> yeah, went, yeah. We went from having a split straight to standing. And I was less like, what Yikes. the heck? <laughs> That's not human, you know? <laughs> well, so he, uh, in the production, you know, while working with this Charles Ridner character, he, uh, they went to Sacramento, California, and they spent over a hundred grand uh, on, on building all these sets. In today's money, it's probably like 11-ish million um, or greater, depending on how you value you evaluate the money <laughs> but um when they built the set it included the pier and so the original ending of the movie was supposed to be a flood sequence which is why a lot of it does take place in the water and with the mm. steamboat mm. because of the the plot of the movie about the steamboat rescuing everyone uh the problem was that in 1927 there's a natural disaster in mississippi with a um like many times mississippi river floods you guys know about this right it, Mississippi off the right. floods. Yeah, I mean, in general. I think I learned about that in like middle school, mm-hmm. but okay. <laughs> right, but in general, it's happened like just, you know, not just this once, but like many, many years, right? Because people who live in that area, just they just have to accept the fact that it, it can happen at any time. So, I mean, 1927 was one of the most destructive uh, floods, something like 27,000 square miles. It, uh, uh, you would get flooded up to 30 feet um, and stuff like that. So, uh, the federal government ended up building a lot of levees and uh, floodways and just reroute them in the water. Something like, you know, 630,000 people were affected. Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, on and on and on. So it was a huge disruption um, in 27. And, and, and I think, uh, I don't know, people lost their lives or something. And it, see that part but it it had a big impact on just massive destruction and loss and so the uh, producer joseph shank was like let's not do the flood because america just experienced this you know and you can uh-huh. have a comedy about flooding <laughs> mm, so yeah. they turned too, too sensitive yeah a little sort of you know bad timing i guess but because they're making these movies so fast, it, it didn't take like four years to make movies back then. It was only months. They, even though the set was already built, they spent an additional twenty-five grand on the cyclone to make break, all these street sets make breakaways, and they also, um, I guess, rented or per, I don't know, rented or purchased. There's a thing called Liberty uh, L12 engines. These are American engines, twenty-seven liter uh, V12 aircraft engines. Uh, 400 horsepower, uh, water cooled <laughs> down to 45 degrees, and so that's that was what allowed him to do all those wind effects. Hmm. Mm. So he spent some money there, and uh, cyclone scene costs about a third of the entire film budget. Uh, the budget is estimated to be 300 to 400 thousand dollars. So times 11, whatever that is Yuck. today, which is Woo. significant still. It's a big chunk of money. It is. Pretty crazy. It looked it. Yeah. It is a big scene, though. I mean, for being a third of the f- film's money, it kind of is the last third of the film. This... It is. But if you think about it, like, um, our hospitality was around less than 100K or less to make, but ended up making somewhere north of three, 400 thousand dollars or beyond to half a million and beyond so the budget of this last movie uh it costs more than the entirety of the profit revenue of what he made in our hospitality does that make sense yeah what is costing him money budget wise that he's spending on the cyclone scenes and other things the actual production costs cost way more than his original like our hospitality movie made in the entire run so it's a huge risk you know 
Yeah, it is a risk. But especially I mean, after I, the general, which lost money, you know. Yeah. Now that you bring that up, I mean, I, that's kind of that's well, it's interesting. Just because I was mentioning this earlier, where you know, it's with these Buster Keaton films, it's like do something different. I mean, I guess this technically is something different, even though he's got like, oh, the, they get married at the end. I mean, having a scene as complex as this, that's also what draws you into his storytelling, mm. whether it's you know linear or not. But I mean, I guess it is technically different because. Did any of his other films have quite the scene like this, minus our hospitality with building a, a river and a waterfall? Hmm. Uh, they all kind of have something. They all have a lot of big set pieces in general, right? Because that's what he likes to do, mm-hmm. right? The general had the train. Um, yeah. Navigator, I think, had some boat stuff, or maybe it was shorts. Um, we know from... Uh, well, Sherlock Jr. was yeah, and in technically one week, I mean, he was spinning yeah. around houses, so I guess that's kind of similar to this. But this is just on such a grander scale and yeah. with more but depth. They, they all have some. He he always likes to make his set pieces come alive as part of another character in his movie. You know, he it's not just the people; it's always something else happening. Um, the set pieces, whether it's like a steam engine on a train or some houses going crazy, you know, that's like. That's what he likes to do, or boat in this case. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so that's kind of his stick is he likes to always, you know, have something happening on the set like that, which is why it costs money. He's kind of like the Marvel type esque figure of the day. I mean, he's not the only one. They're all wanting to entertain the audiences with sort of the visual grandeur and special effects, you know, of its day. So, He's not unique, and he, but he likes to be a showman, you know, when when making these movies. So yeah, he was um, he was a little uh, I don't know if suicidal is the right word, but it, he made that uh, intonation. I guess he was saying how uh, at the end of this era, it's the end of his Buster Keaton production company. You know, this is the last movie where he himself was going to be a hired hand and not a runner of the studio you know, of his own business, essentially. Mm. And so yeah, scary. when he shot that risky stunt where, you know, towards the end when their house falls on him. Yep. He was like, he, he, he said at that point, he didn't care if he lived or die. He was mm-hmm. mad at himself or he, he would have never done it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Is that the mark on the ground telling cause exactly where to stand was a nail, like a nail, like a little nail. Hmm. So that's crazy, you know. <laughs> My God, yep. I mean, I would hope they'd at least fill the house with something light, like foam. It didn't look like it. <laughs> no, it didn't look like it. Not at all. <laughs> if that flattened, no. Him, if you missed, I think you'd be dead. Yeah, it hit the ground really hard. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's any coming back from that. So. Yeah, he's but really, anyways, he's a bit of a madman. He's he's a little crazy, especially towards these latter errors i think <laughs> because of all that's going on in his life i think he's just mm. you know mm. what's his um, biography called <laughs> what was that i said what's his biography called just buster keaton i don't know he, he he's written one he's written an auto bio but i don't know if his auto bio goes into his personal mess uh, i'm sure the biographies <sighs> do but his personal bio the auto bio i don't know if I don't know if he, I haven't read it, so I don't know if he talks about it. But if you Google it, he, you can probably find it. There's, um, he's, I know he's written one. I'm, I have not read it. Um, a lot of these silent film star often will write one or more autobiographies later on. Not all of them, but some of them will. Um, but yeah, so it, when this came out, uh, it was a huge box office failure. It received a lot of mixed reviews upon release. Uh, Variety, the magazine, described it as a pip of a comedy or really one of Keaton's best. And, really? Uh, yeah. Another one said uh, perhaps one of the, perhaps the best comedy of the year thus far. Hmm. And advised exhibitors should go after it. And so, um, yeah, it, you know, and then some people say it's a gloomy comedy. Some people say it's gloomy. a sorry affair and the plot is nonsensical. So, it's uh, hit and miss, uh, I think, around that time frame when it came out. 
<laughs> uh, but I think over the years, it's proven itself to be a masterpiece. One of the last masterpieces he's, he's working. Of course, we know inspired, you know, Steamboat Willie. Yeah. And the Falling House gag uh, has been recreated many times. And stuff like MacGyver, Jackie Chan stuff, Arrested Development, mm. even. <laughs> Apparently, there's an episode. I don't remember this one because I've seen all Arrested Development. But the one where they build a house. Oh, and one of the show's characters named Buster. I forgot about that. <laughs> hmm. Um. Anyways, so it goes on. So there's a. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of um, inspirations uh, of you know the way that uh, this film was, how it inspired other things, and those legacy. Looking back, one of his greats. So. But yeah, any any uh, uh, last comments, especially in the last. Cyclone scene with the houses, uh, and also I, where the tree got lifted up and all that stuff. Yeah, just yeah, that was kind of no, just funny. just him diving from off the ship was another thing I I saw coming, but I was still was excited to see it when he did it. I said you know, I saw him climb up to the third floor again on the ship. I said, oh, he's probably going to dive out the window or something, you know, land in the water, and then. When I saw him tying the rope around himself, I said, oh, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. <laughs> yeah, it takes some skill to do that because if you hit yep. the water at the wrong angle, it would be dangerous. So. But I thought it was great. This, the ship really was rolling on by. So he timed it very well to land almost right next to Mr. King without having the passing ship then pull him away from him. <laughs> yeah. Would have been a kind of foul up on the whole uh, um, take. I mean, the only other thing I remember is that I thought was really funny was that he was on the bed and then was getting blown away on the bed. Oh, yeah. And he went through (laughs) the stables. And when he came out from under the covers in the stables with the horses looking on, the one of the horses on the left actually was quite was stunned. It was it was surprised <laughs> and and recoiled when he came out from underneath the cover. The horse went whoa. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> and then of course the boat bed kept moving again, and all the horses were like whatever. <laughs> I thought that was very funny. Yeah, if you watch like the third horse on the left, he, he's watching the sheet move, and then when Buster Keaton comes popping out, it's like he, he recoils. That's all. That's all I got. <laughs> I I did see um because I watched it on my uh big screen. I I could see the uh ropes and strings that used to pull the buildings apart at some point like oh. uh, there's some shots of the main street. If you look at the main street where there was a scene where the guy was trying to load up his car, but then the car started blowing away while the guy was hanging on to the car. Mm, I, yeah. yeah, I like and that. The car flipped over and I think at some point in that scene some of the facades of the corner buildings just like ripped away due to uh the cyclone um that scene had some ropes or some something not strings but like some something strong like that onto the right and you could see it just pull at a rapid force and pull the whole thing apart you could just see that on the screen so if you blow it up large enough it's harder to spot on the small screen uh, if you watch it on a smaller screen, but uh, blown up, you could see the totally see the string. That's yeah. funny because I was actually looking for that too. But yeah. I have a you know I have my computer monitor screen and that's pretty big, but I still didn't even notice that. Yeah, so that's yeah. <laughs> pretty neat that you saw it on big. your big screen. <laughs> yeah, that's too bad. Yeah, I have a hundred inch uh, diagonal projector screen, so I can see details like that. Wow, nice. fancy. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I think, um, so the ending, you know, was the, like I said, typical ending. Like we talked about the, the, the father is all happy. They all lived through it. And I guess they allowed the kids to get married, which of course at the end he dives and they're like, where's he going? And of course he somehow finds a minister. <laughs> I know. That I know, was that so was... funny though. Cause I she looks sad. Like, where's that? he going? <laughs> it's just this is dorky looking priest and the lifesaver. <laughs> It's like, what am I doing here? <laughs> uh, it's like, he says, pardon me a minute and dives in the water and then comes back with a minister. Like, what? Because <laughs> he's always off trope. to the side waiting, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a plot detail. 
the father's name, uh, 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 the uh, Steamboat Bill Sr., is played by uh, Ernest Torrance, um, mm-hmm. who is a character actor. He would go on to play, uh, he has played Broken Chains at that point. He would go on to work with uh, Clara Bow uh, in Man Trap and also Gary Cooper, uh, Lily Damita in Fighting Caravans. He's six four. He often plays, like I said, character actor, cold eyed and opposing villains. Uh, he's Scottish, and uh, but he wouldn't make the transition to sound because I think he would die a few years into that. Um, so that's that's his career in a nutshell. Uh, Ernest Torrance, the character actor, uh, the guy who played the girl's father. Uh, also another character actor from the stage. He's English. Mm-hmm. Uh, appeared in 175 films between 1919 and 1949. Um, immigrated uh, from Lancashire, England, uh, but ultimately uh, died in Hollywood, California. He's been through uh, a number of... Uh, uh, he's also in City Girl. He He has like a look. You know, he has this, like, all these characters, character actors, like, you know, this, the girl's dad looks like, like, an uppity, up, you know, character mm-hmm. guy, and the other guy looks like a me. Like, you, you could just tell by looking mm-hmm. at them in, in the film what the character is supposed to be. Yeah. You know what I mean? The yeah, um, steam, Steamboat uh, Bill's senior, his father, kept reminding me of um, the actor James Cromwell. Oh yeah, yeah, I yeah. Thought they yeah, looked yeah. a lot alike. Oh yeah, yeah. Character actors—they have like they carry uh, themselves in a certain way. So, mm-hmm. if we ever get through F.W. Murner's uh, filmography, towards the end, he made a movie called City Girl, uh, and Tom McGuire, the girl's father, would appear in that as well. And the girl is uh, Marion Byron. Which, I uh, liked her a lot who is American silent film, maybe not silent, the movie comedian. Uh, she's following, she followed her sister into a short stage career as a singer and dancer. And then this is her first role. Uh-huh. Bill, Bill Jr. Pretty good. Yep. And from there on, she would get hired by Hal Roach, which is a very famous uh, early era uh, film director into short, um, short movies with other, uh, popular sort of stars of their day, uh, Max Davidson, Edgar Kennedy, Charlie Chase, and uh, Anita Garvin, and they would team up and basically make a quote unquote female Lauren Hardy hmm. uh, alternative three a trilogy from uh, 1928 to 1929. She left the studio before making it in the sound era. Uh, work on musicals like. Uh, Broadway Babies with Alice White and Technicolor feature Golden Dawn. But then they uh, started to get smaller in the roles um, in movies like Meet the Baron, 1933, with Jack Pearl, uh, Hips of Prey with uh, William Wilsley, and I think her final appearance is uh, Five of a Kind. So, And... Uh, because of family, I think she'd just uh, get married and have kids, and then their career pretty much ends. Mm. Unfortunately, that Ugh. happens to a lot of them. <laughs> Such the feminist Sadly. way to go. Ugh. Sadly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if the 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 like the that era allowed uh, you know mothers to continue working beyond post kids. You know, she she got Probably married not. to. Uh, somebody uh, this is Lou something in 1932, and they had two sons. Yeah, born in 39, 44, and that's perfectly yeah. times with the end of her career. <laughs> yeah. Her last film, 1938. Her first baby was 1939, and that's it. Yeah. So that's that's the end of the career. <laughs> I would expect only the really rich who could hire a nanny while they work, and I I think most mothers of that time still wanted to spend tons of time with their own babies. What's what's um. What is her? What is the most famous? One? Isn't it Greta Garbo? What does she do? Greta Garbo. I don't know much about. I mean, I know who she is. Garbo, mm. who turned her back on stardom and went abroad and said, "Yeah, leave me alone." Beautiful actress, <laughs> talented. But does she get? 
Married and stuff? I don't know. Let me see. I know she kept working until she didn't want to, but I don't know if she ever had a family and stuff. I don't know. I don't think no she did. clue. I can't even think of like one of her most famous movies. You guys might know more than me. I just know it's you know glamorous. Oh, she's a huge, huge star. Huge like, uh, star. But can I name a movie? No. Ninochka. <laughs> oh yeah, I have. Oh yeah, I've heard of Ninochka. Huge. Um. Uh, Flesh and the Good. Devil is very popular, I would say. Uh, Not the world of Flesh and the Devil. No, this is 1926. Okay. Um, directed by Clarence Brown with uh, John Gilbert. Yeah, actually, Ninotchka is the only one I can think of funny well, i know she did a lot of movies but yeah so she's um so Ninochka is one of the last ones she did um camille it's another popular one uh conquest the one before that anna karina is another oh one. that's oh, right anna, anna karina. karina yeah yeah, yeah. The, the painted veil um let me see grand hotel she was in that i don't know if you guys remember watching that but no it's a, won the no. best picture of that year 1932 really yeah, uh, Matahari, another popular one. I don't know if that's the one that she got injured by the animal, the tiger, or was that a different movie? But anyways, um, romance, Anna Christie. There's a there's a ton. There's a ton. She's she's just one of the biggest. But unfortunately, she just stopped working one day, and that was it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, yeah. Well. I don't want to go too much out of tangent. One of the one of the best Hollywood uh, misquotes is, uh, they they quote they always quote her as "I want to be left alone." That's right. You know, but the actual the the um no they quote her as they quote her as "I want to be alone," but that's not what she said. She wants to be left alone is what she said. Mm-hmm. It's a difference. She yeah. didn't want to be alone. <laughs> Right. Actually, now that we're talking about her on one of those uh, silent film pages on Facebook, they were some people have been posting just the costumes they've been wearing. So I actually saved one of her outfits. I know you guys can't see it on the podcast, obviously, <laughs> but I'm like looking at her right now and I'm like, oh, this outfit she's wearing. I just want to know what color it is. She looks so gorgeous. <laughs> But I saved it to my computer because I'm like, oh, maybe one day I'll make something like that because I'm kind of into costumes. But <laughs> it's funny. Um, I, I, I've i seen her so many times and I mean, I know how she speaks. I know what she looks like. But the funny thing is that aside from Ninochka, I can't remember seeing any of her movies distinctly. No, I don't think I've ever watched any of her films, even though I know yeah. who she is. She has some silent films. We should. We should put that on the schedule. <laughs> mm, <laughs> really? I'll watch that. Yeah. I mean, a, a big half of her career is in silent film, but unfortunately, oh. probably a big chunk of it was lost, right? It's That's why they did the movie Garbo Talks. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I would say the other one is like uh, uh, Dietrich is the other one. Marlene Dietrich, Mar- yeah. 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 She got married and had some children, one child. But did she keep working after that is the question. Got me. Let me see. I gotta take off though. My brother's waiting for me. Okay. So yeah. Um, I think that's probably about it for uh, this movie. Uh, unless you guys have any other closing thoughts. I give it a B plus. <laughs> I would. Ag- I would agree. That's about what I'd give it to. <laughs> All right. So, um, I don't know what I'd give it. I-, I just have a tough time giving things. Uh, any? I know because you gotta f- kind of find the position between so many other things. <laughs> I know. I, I mean, how do you say that this is like a for me, uh, you know, a five star or something compared to like some other movies? You know, like my favorite is in the silent era is the F. W. Murnau's movies. And yeah, stuff. well, the general is a five. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I, I just have a, a tough time. It is pretty good. I, I wouldn't say it's his best. But, uh, no, definitely not. I still like, for example, I still like uh, Our Hospitality mm-hmm. uh, above this one uh, just because it's pretty charming. It makes an so, interesting, it makes more of a statement than this one. Yeah, exactly. But um, but yeah, so just FYI, Dietrich did keep working after the uh, 
the kid was born. So I, I, get, I, I think you're right. Like some people who are in power, they'll just keep working. But people who aren't, they, they'll just retire. Makes sense. Um, okay, so that to wrap it up today, um, that's probably uh, the last of that uh, Buster Keaton that we have seen so far. So next week we'll move on to something else. Um, but um, thank you, Lily. Thank you, Bob. And uh, thank you, listeners. Um, if you don't mind leaving uh, a star rating or review in the Apple Podcast platform, that would help us get more visibility um, from other film lovers. Or uh, you can send us an email with thoughts and comments and ideas uh, by sending email to watchingsilentfilmsplural at gmail.com. And you can find more of our stuff at watching silent films plural. That's watching silent films dot wordpress dot com. And um, go check out um, a science fiction book literature podcast that kind of started called Chrononauts. That's the word chrono, like time. Ooh. And then knots, like astronauts. Oh, yeah. N-A-U-T-S. Chrononauts. Yeah, chrononauts. Um, other people have came up with it, so we didn't really come up with it. We're just kind of cool. piggyback on it. I'm in the first episode, or what's called episode zero, but due to time... I, I, I basically uh, <laughs> more background people after that. <laughs> so. We're talking chrononauts and you said due to time. <laughs> due to time. <laughs> the, the lack of time for me to commit to it. So I'm in the first episode, but I, I still kind of keep up in the background stuff uh, afterwards. But anyway, check that out. Um, and got some other things cooking as well down the road. But um, that's it for me. Anything else from you guys, Bob and Lily? Nope. Maybe promote. <laughs> Farewell. One day uh, you guys will have something no. to promote. <laughs> no promotion. Not yet. I'm getting there. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's coming along. Well, can we promote that we might have another guest speaker who's a very well known? Maybe uh, we we oh, have to finalize oh. the time, so we'll keep that a surprise Ooh. for now. Oh, secret! Um, we'll, I didn't we'll give keep, anything away. We'll keep people on the on the edge, Ooh. trying to come back to us <laughs> to listen in and figure out who it's going to be. Who is it? I don't know. <laughs> I know um, you don't. <laughs> yeah. So. Thank you, listeners. Thank you, Bob and Lily. And um, this episode is produced by Lily and edited by Fung. And thank you very much. We'll see you again next time or talk to you next time. Bye-bye.